the brand of Harry and Meghan as the Sussexes continues to implode, we also have the very interesting simultaneous collapse of brand Meghan Markle. Yes, Meg was very much determined, even though that her and Harry were like salt and pepper, that she was going to have her own distinct brand. Went into all these deals. I'm sure always Megan had it in the back of her mind, even though they were going into these things together, that was really her driving this. We see this throughout the last year or so. Megan got the interview with The Cut. Megan got the interview with Variety that really touted their entertainment credentials in many ways. And this was published just a little over a month after the Queen's death. Megan very much has been one trying to establish herself and her brand while Harry does his own thing. He does the memoir, which is done, sold really well, but put him in a really poor light. He's doing all these court cases and everything. So Harry very much is growing his own brand, which has really nothing to do with Megan's. But as the Spotify deal collapses, it's really a reflection on Megan in many ways, because Megan was the one with the podcast. Megan was the one actually producing content. However, even when she was doing it, it wasn't very successful. And she's still completely married to this idea of archetypes, even though Spotify told her, well, this did okay, but can you give us something better? And I feel like she's digging her heels in, and that's why they lost the deal, because she was like, no, there's nothing better, it's archetypes or nothing at all. And Spotify's like, well, we'll do nothing at all. And on social media itself, I'm on Twitter quite a bit, so, RNN underscore Royal News if you want to follow me on Twitter. And what has been really fascinating too is to see how Meghan stands, those people who devotedly follow Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, are also having this little mini meltdown as Harry and Meghan, particularly Meghan, that she's really exposed for being a grifter, for being a nobody, for being somebody who's desperate for the spotlight without an ounce of talent to back that up. And how basically all of Hollywood is taking one gigantic step back and going, well, we tried. We had a relationship with Megan. We tried to make this deal work with Megan, and it didn't come to pass. It didn't work. And so we are going to examine the collapse of brand Megan because Megan has been the one throughout this whole thing who has been very, very devoted to trying to craft her own brand and narrative and how it's just completely disintegrated around her, much like her and Harry's broader brand. And I think that's a reflection very much on Megan because we got some new poll numbers regarding Megan's popularity and it's not looking good for her at all. In fact, Harry got a bit of a boost from last time while as Megan, oh, she's still down in the dumps there. And we're going to examine a little bit this because I think it's fascinating going forward regardless of her deal with William Morrison Endeavor because guys, this is interesting about how royal influencers do they work or will they always crash and burn? But if you guys haven't been here to Royal News Network before, my name is Brittany and I provide compelling royal commentary about the latest news. Sometimes a little bit of gossip is sprinkled in there. So if you guys want to subscribe, that would be great. I'm trying to head towards 150,000. I just surpassed 119,000. So I would love to have you guys on board. This is an amazing channel. I also have a fashion channel and I'm gonna work on a fashion video after this where I talk about the best and worst looks of the week. I usually have a tiara video once a week, usually on Tuesday. And so it is an exciting place if you wanna head over there. I have an upcoming trip to Germany and Austria as well. So if you wanna talk about all of this Harry and Meghan stuff, I am there with you. You can check it out over in a link down below there. And I also have a weekly newsletter. And before we get to the collapse of brand Meghan, we do have some sad news about the five people who were on that submarine going to the Titanic. Apparently, it did implode basically on the way down. That's what the, the main theory is. We know that there has been debris found, and we know basically that the submarine disintegrated in some sort of way. So all the five people on there have been lost. So tragically, the Titanic has really claimed five more lives because if it wasn't for the Titanic, people wouldn't be going down there. I find the Titanic super interesting. I did a report on it in high school. She actually had two sister ships and one of them also sank. So that was the Britannic. It was actually a hospital ship in World War I. It was reconned for that roll and it hit a mine under the Mediterranean Ocean and sunk very, very quickly, actually much faster than the Titanic. You can actually still see that wreck. It's a little bit safer to get to than the Titanic itself. I have a Perhaps, I don't know if it would be a video here or somewhere else, but I'd love to actually talk more about it because I find it 
fascinating because there's this whole other aspect of deep sea salvaging and looking for shipwrecks and those sorts of things that's going on behind the scenes here as well, which I think drove at least part of this in addition to just the general interest in the Titanic. But <laughs> I have been on two, you could say submarines. One of them was in Disneyland and one of them in, was in Hawaii and I was nervous on both. I can't imagine getting in that little itty bitty sub that looked really janky and going down to the bottom of the ocean. I would not have done it. Always, 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 if you feel red flags about something as dangerous as what they were doing, listen to those red flags. Listen to those, you know, the, the spider sense in your mind telling you, mm, you know what, this might be not be the best idea in the world. Either way, it's still a very sad situation for all of those involved. And obviously a couple of them actually were familiar to members of the royal family. Himesh, one of those who died, it was actually a charitable contributor to the Prince's Trust. So this is King Charles's charity. So there's a, some personal royal connections there. And then we also have Royal Ascot and huge congratulations to King Charles because his horse won. This is his first Ascot as King and his horse won the King George V title. That is so exciting. I love that for Charles. Apparently Catherine and William will be at Royal Ascot tomorrow. So we've seen a lot of Royals. I got to get some fashion things together for that, but it's been some interesting Royal fashion watching. And so it'll be great to do a video about that later this week. And then we also have Catherine and William apparently did a little tour of Eaton with Prince George. So apparently at about the age of 13, so he's still three years away from now is he will be going to a higher school of education. So a college of some sort and not a college in the way we think of it in the States, but how they think of it in the UK. And so he was touring around Eaton. That's where Prince William went. And it is an all boys school. I, I always thought that Catherine and William would send their kids to a co-ed school because they wanted to keep them together. But it could be that George and Louis or perhaps not Louis goes to Eaton. So we will wait and see how that happens. But obviously as well, Eaton would be a nice place because it is right next door to where Catherine and William are living in Windsor. And so that would be really, really convenient for them and it would allow George to still stay at home because they're not having their children bored yet. I don't know if they will, which would be definitely a change in tradition, but I think also keep the kids closed, I think would be a good thing as well. So it'll be fascinating to see where that goes. And when we hear more information, obviously Kensington Palace is keeping some pretty close lips. We also had still the continuing visit between Belgium and the Netherlands. And it looked like they had some fierce rain today. It's been raining a lot where I am. So I feel for the ladies in their hats trying to look their best while the rain is pouring behind them. <laughs> so it looked like though they had an amazing time. These are very, countries that have very close historic ties. So it looks like they had just a fabulous time together. We also saw tiaras and I showed some of those in my last video. So if you want to check that out, that would be awesome. Any tiara spotting, oh, it just makes my heart sing. So absolutely love that. And I forgot to mention earlier as well, William has a whole interview in the Sunday Times that he gave in around his birthday talking about how he wanted to try to figure out a way to get some subsidized housing more in Cornwall because he owns the Duchy of Cornwall and he wants to address the issue of homelessness, which I think is a fantastic thing to do. And he had this great quote, basically talking about how he wants to do things, but not have it be a performance. And so I just really appreciated that from William. I thought it was a fantastic quote and something that very much is the antithesis of Harry and Meghan because part of the problem with Bran Meghan switching over to our main story of today, which is that Meghan Everything has to be a performance with her. That's always the vibe I get from her is that she's not doing it just to do it just because she feels led to. She's doing it as part of a performance aspect of her brand to make sure people know that she's charitable, she's giving, she's funny. I found it really fascinating when I was trying to get the little clip about her talking about how you need to thrive and not just survive and how like giggly and unprofessional really she was in that interview and how it just very much came across as unprofessional, contrived, very much like she was trying to put on this act of an innocent, uh, doleful, bashful young woman in her mid to late thirties. But that's part of the problem with Megan's brand overall is that people don't believe her and her actions oftentimes come across to many people as very, very much an act, very much a facade of Megan. We hear this just time and time and time again. And we have this actually interesting clip that came up earlier today about how Megan is sort of a two-faced. So 
Andy Cohen, I guess, he talked about in his interview for Archetypes, he was in the last episode with Trevor Noah. I didn't make it that far in Archetypes. I think I, I lasted through the first three or four episodes and then I just had to give up because it was just horrifically bad listening to it. And he talked about how Megan, basically they had this great conversation and he had this little quip about if were you silent or silenced and that he was really excited about apparently they dropped it but the big thing was megan introduced him talking about how she thought that his show the real housewives was bad for women yet she never ever brought that up in his interview and he was really miffed about it so take a listen to this little bit clip here from a recent interview not with andy but with somebody else and then they get to the podcast it actually comes out yeah but then before they air her inter his interview on the podcast Megan gives you know one of her like pre-recorded spiels right basically saying how she was like kind of nervous to interview Andy because Housewives and Bravo like hasn't been great for women and like feminism like you never said that to me in the interview and like maybe if you did we would have had a much more complex and dynamic and interesting conversation and the podcast wouldn't have been so boring right. to say that as like a precursor to the interview and then not bring it up is like so tacky and but like to say it and then not say it to my face is like so oh, cowardly. I didn't know that. I know it was so interesting. I know. I feel like she just keeps making like all the wrong decisions. Yeah. This clip I think exemplifies why making fetch happen for Megan. So basically making Megan happen. is just not going to work for her because people don't like her. And that's a huge problem when you're trying to build a brand is that you have to be likable. And for most people, she is not. And as she's tried to take this opportunity and this platform that the royal family gave her and to enrich herself, it's really come across very much rubbing the people the wrong way. And even though people really, really dislike Harry too, a lot of people, and I, I would say myself is in somewhat in this crowd too, is that Everybody knows that Harry, what Harry is doing is wrong, yet we also know he's an incredibly dim guy and perhaps doesn't totally know what he's doing either. Even though he's an adult, even though he probably proclaims he does, we're all sitting there going, you know, you, you barely graduated high school. Maybe, maybe, do you really realize we, that what you're doing can come across as really, really badly? Because it doesn't seem like it, because sometimes he makes statements, like he doesn't understand why his family won't talk to him. I'm like, because you keep talking about them. Th that's why they don't talk to you. That that should be obvious to Harry, but that Harry doesn't seem to get it that there seems to be that divide. I think people have this sort of feeling that he is this little lost land that Meghan took advantage of. And because of that, his popularity of course has cratered, but it's maintained always a higher stance than Meghan's. And we have the most recent YouGov polls to talk about in this instance. So let's go ahead and take a look here real quick. So Prince Harry's net favorability has dropped from negative 34 to negative 36. So that means that only 28% of people have a positive opinion about him. 64% have a negative opinion about him. And then when we get to Megan, hers is getting increasingly, increasingly worse. So it says that her total positive is 21%, while her net total negative is 68%. That gives her a net favorability of negative 47%. Now we compare it to King Charles, who has a net favorability of 32%. Camilla only 4%. Actually, hers has gone down from 9% in April. Then we have Prince William at 57%. So that's up from 52% in April. And then Catherine is at 59. Of course, Andrew is at negative 78, but Princess Anne is at 60. So she barely edges out Catherine. And although that's just a sample of Britain's about 2014 people were surveyed for this poll. And how did this happen for Megan? Because Megan had created her own brand with the tick. Was it really all that successful? Eh, probably not. But Megan very much had a brand that she was working towards, a brand of Megan. She wanted to be cool, sophisticated. She wanted to cite her knowledge of wine because she named it the TIG, which nobody knew what that was. And she, she captioned, oh, it's the TIG moment, which again, nobody, absolutely nobody has any clue what she is talking about, but it worked for Megan. You got to give her props. It did work for her. But what happened when she married Harry is that she went from being in a very, very small pond where nobody knew her to this huge, gigantic ocean. The footprint of the British Royal family is 
massive across the world. There are tons of European royals. Most of them you probably have never heard about. I've heard about them because I'm a nerd about royals and that's part of the reason why I have this channel. I could pretty much name most of the major royals throughout Europe just by looking at them. But when it comes to the British, most people know if you say Will and Kate or if you show a picture of them, people know who they are. Most of the time when it comes to if they know who you are, the, the percentages is always way in the high 90s when it comes to William, Catherine, Harriet, and Meghan. Though Meghan was in the lower 90s in the last Yuga poll, usually they're in the higher 90s. So this tells us that when it comes to the royals is that they do have this massive notoriety. And so Meghan and her little, very carefully curated, managed image on the TIG, she thought she could plant that into the British royals. And you gotta think too, when Meghan gave us a great insight into how she thinks, because she said that when she was first being introduced to Harry or the idea of dating or meeting Harry was first being floated around, she obviously said, well, was he nice? But she also wanted to look at his Instagram profile because that would give her the greatest insight into who Harry is. But if you have let's say half a brain, you know that social media is a carefully curated and managed image of what we want people to see us as, not who we really are. Everybody does it from Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We all want people to see us in a particular way. So we either post a lot because we want to brag perhaps, we post a lot because we're just really extroverted, or we just don't post a lot because we're, we're worried about where we are in life compared to other people. There's all sorts of different things that factor into what we do on our social media profiles. And because of that, Instagram, is not an accurate reflection of who somebody is, like Megan claimed. It's a reflection of who they think they are. So if you look at Tig, and obviously we don't have access really to the Tig or Megan's Instagram anymore, it was a very cur carefully curated and managed image of what Megan wanted to us to perceive her as. And again, she adopted and pulled all this into the royal family. But what happens is that once you are in the royal family, well, guess what? reporters begin to dig into you because the social contract that you have of being a royal is that you get immense privilege, you get access to castles, free housing, clothes, jewelry, all these sorts of things. But in exchange, you have to give up a part of yourself. You have to give up a part of your life to public consumption. That is the agreement you make. And it, it stands within all the royal families. You get invasive questions that most people probably wouldn't be asked, not perhaps in the way some celebrities are, but in a similar vein, you are answerable to the people. So if you purchase, let's say, like Megan, a $100,000 Dior dress for a single engagement while you're pregnant, which is also quite an ugly dress, the color was unflattering on her, the fit was awful, it was a terrible, horrible dress. Guess what, people will talk about it because they are funding your trip to Morocco. They are funding part of that dress. So you are answerable to them. But Meghan Markle didn't like that. She didn't like that at all. So as soon as she and Harry could, they strong armed the royal family into giving them their own social media profile. If you remember, they had Sussex Royal and well, there was a part of me that thought the branding for Sussex Royal was actually her best branding ever because I think the TIG is awful. I think Archwell is awful. But it's also a bit cliche and a bit perhaps not as regal. Even though the foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge as it began, now the, the Prince of Princess of Wales is a bit of a mouthful, it's not catchy, but it was very regal. And Meghan Markle tried to, again, carefully curate and manage that Instagram profile to reflect very much her. It was her branding. And Harry was just along for the ride because Harry, I think, is a simp. I don't think he is wise to what his wife, wife is doing. I think he's very, probably, he's not, business savvy, and I don't think really she is either, but he's not social media savvy. He is really not a sharp tool. He's not a bright bulb. And she was easily able to manipulate him into those things. So once she got that Instagram profile, she was carefully once again building her brand image so that when they left and they initiated Mexit, she would be able to take all of that that she's grown and take that Instagram profile and transform it into Megan, the Duchess of Sussex for everyone to see. But the royal family threw a lot of wrenches into that because again, royal families are not like celebrities. They can't just let you do willy nilly. So what did they do? Especially because at the time when they left, they were on 
the government's dime. So what did the royal family do? Well, they said, well, we own Sussex Royal, so you don't, so you don't get to take that. We are not going to give into your demands that you are a part-time working royal, that you come when you want, you leave when you want, that you don't really do anything unless you want to do it, and that you still get to go on tours and stuff. No, we're not going to do that. That did throw a wrench into her plans. But Meghan, she's resourceful, and perhaps it was best for her because then she could really totally pull Harry away from his family, which she's done, and really establish herself in Hollywood. She helped them get these mega deals because again, Harry is a simp. I don't think he could get in front of Hollywood producers and spend them a decent tale. I don't think he can do it. And so Megan was the one who brought him to do that. She seemed to have, even though most of her ideas, I think at the end of the day, were probably not that great, had some ideas where apparently Harry had no ideas, at least according to Bill Simmons, because he tried to help Harry with the podcast. And apparently that's quite the story. And I think it's because Harry is not necessarily the super brightest guy in the world. And that's some of where the humor of the story comes from. But I digress. So she was able to get all these businesses together and she allowed Harry to do his thing, investigating his life and his memoir and everything like that and let him go sort of off the deep end while she was over here trying to look to the future. Cause that's what they've said in a lot of these articles. It's Megan's looking towards the future and Harry's looking towards the past. So she is looking at all these and she's trying to build, she's got archetypes and she's got the Netflix series and she's got her book and everything. And so she's trying to do all this. She did obviously the sit down interview with Ellen DeGeneres, which was awful. That backfired, I think, tremendously on her because she was made to look like a fool and for people to laugh at her. I mean, she literally squatted on national television in a very undignified and unladylike way. If Ellen DeGeneres had told me to do that and I was a royal, I would have gone, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Because it's just so... Ugh. And it's just something to where you are there to be a mockery. You are there to be the court jester. That's what Megan let Ellen DeGeneres turn her into, was the court jester. So why did brand Megan fail? Because it was built on a false premise. The false premise is, is that Megan is this charitable, loving, gracious, kind, wonderful human being who has no fault seemingly. It's always when you look at the interviews with her and Harry, it's always Harry with the issues and Megan's like, well, I helped him get, get help with X. It's like, well, didn't you get help with X too? Like, what were you doing? Because I think there's a two way street here. I think it can both be that Harry has issues and you have issues. And so if you guys work on your issues together, but it's always about Harry working on his issues, never Megan working on hers. And she has told us that how successful she was and everything, but you don't really get the sense of that because Megan was really never all that successful an actress. Yes, she had a recurring role on the TV series, but she was she was six or seven on the call sheet of eight. So she wasn't that high up. She wasn't a great actress. She couldn't really get anything, I think, beyond Suits. Suits was always gonna be her pinnacle. She could maybe go back down to Hallmark or other shows, but she was aging out of Hollywood at that point. And given that she was closing in on 40, once she hits that, that age, she really, can't play the sexy hot young thing anymore. So she's gonna have to find different roles. And most of those roles would require a greater degree of skill in acting than Meghan Markle had. And this aspect of charity just doesn't seem to fly when Meghan seems to show up at a charitable event, in this case, the Invictus Games, and $65,000 at least of new clothes and jewelry. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, this is a charity event, great time, to rewear everything, pretty much, and you're treating this as a fashion show, wearing $1,000 sunglasses. Yes, those sunglasses she's wearing in that picture cost a grand. The jeans she's wearing in that outfit are $600 jeans. And she wore a necklace worth $15,000 or so. It was an insane amount of flashy, flashy money. And again, Catherine has gone to events wearing very, very expensive pieces of jewelry, but from the Royal Collection. And because they're from the Royal Collection, you can somewhat excuse them because it's not like she went out and bought a necklace that's in the six figures. No, it was already there. The family's had it for 50, 60, 70 years. And so if she wore it, it's not as big a deal as Megan going out and buying a $15,000 necklace, perhaps 
just to wear at a charity event. And if it was something that she borrowed, then they should have been clear about that because again, it crosses the wires. I don't feel like you can be totally charitable and yet also be using this charity as a fashion show to promote various brands. I don't think that totally works, especially because she's not deeply involved in it. And you even think of her charitable project with SmartWorks, which helps women with resume and, and job interviewing skills, and she did this capsule collection for her. Great, sure, but at least one of the outfits was designed by a friend of hers. So you could say, yes, it's all charitable, but that friend does actually make a commission off it because not 100% of the proceeds are going to SmartWorks, but a portion. So the other portion is going to her friend, Misha Nono. And so was Misha doing this to actually help the charity or to help herself? and was willing to give a little bit to the charity on the side. So it again, it crosses these lines that don't necessarily need to be crossed. Now, perhaps other royals do similar things to a certain extent, but nobody's really trying to merchandise the way Megan was when she was a royal. And Megan, again, she comes across when you watch interviews with her as acting very contrived, very much trying to have the giggles in the right place, doing everything perfectly so you can get a sense of the manufactured image that she wants rather than her being a real person. Because the greatest indicator is that despite the fact that they say how great Megan is, we know she's not because we've had a myriad of complaints about bullying. We've had a staff member turnover up the wazoo for Harry and Meghan. Now the billing allegations of course are alleged, but you can't really deny that something happened. Something didn't go right. People were not happy. And because of that, negative stories about Meghan went out and Meghan wasn't happy about those. But at the same time, I'm like, well, honey, if you were nice to people, those negative stories probably wouldn't get out. But because there was a negative perception of you, because you had bad interactions with everyone, they were more than willing to turn on you once it suited their needs. And this negative perception of Megan, I think is something that she hasn't been able to shake because she hasn't done anything genuine after that. She hasn't done anything. We have all these stories about how great she is, but we don't really see it. It's always a friend reporting, oh, she's so lovely. Or it's a ghostwriter of Prince Harry going, oh, look, she baked me something. I'm like, so? She obviously wanted to get something from you because she wants you to write a decent book about Harry, so it sells well, so she makes money. It's, it's not that hard. So it's like, is she really being kind to you or is she wanting something from you? Because I think the greatest indicator of a good boss, you could say in these type of circumstances is not how they treat people who are at the same level or something that they want from them. It's how they treat their staff. And Harry and Meghan obviously treat their staff poorly. That's why so many of them want to leave and continue to leave all the time. And I focused more on this in my other video, so I won't go too much into it, but I think it is important to note that Megan really had everything possible to make herself work, to make brand Megan work. And it failed because of Megan. Megan was the one who failed her brand because she thought she was too big to fail her fans are melting down over this whole thing. They are completely losing their minds over the fact that Megan is failing and fa failing so spectacularly. And I think it's because they are married to the Instagram image of Megan that doesn't exist. The facade of success that she's wrapped herself in by paying off things that she didn't earn. And because she didn't earn them, you can't really cite them as laurels of success. So when it comes to the Spotify podcast, I had somebody on Twitter go, it was the number one podcast in the world. And I was like, well, it can't actually be that because it's only on Spotify. <laughs> and we know what the number one podcast in the world is. It's Joe Rogan. And although Joe Rogan is on Spotify and it's exclusive to Spotify, we have been told by people involved in the behind the scenes of Spotify, that his stuff blows everybody else out of the water. So even if you're number two to Joe Rogan, let's say he gets, he gets like upwards of like seven to eight, 10 million views per episode. So Megan perhaps got a hundred thousand and she was number two or got a million and she was number two. So she's not even remotely hitting his numbers. And an interesting comparison too, I was listening to the girls next door podcast 
because <laughs> I, I used to watch this series way back in the day in reality TV show world when it was like 2005. And what's interesting about that is they just celebrated their 16 millionth download and they are on, and they're on all platforms and they have, I want to say almost 40 episodes now or something. Cause they're going, they're splitting every episode into two pieces. Some of it's okay. Some of it's like, eh, I could stop complaining about X anymore. I don't care anymore. But what you see is that they, they're only gotten 16 million downloads and they were up high there in the rankings of Spotify yet. They only have 16 million downloads. And I think at some point, I don't think they ever really beat Megan cause they debuted about the same time, but I think it exemplifies that they had 16 million downloads. So maybe they got the, first million the first time and then it's really slowed down since then because I can see that because there was a great interest I think at the beginning of some of what they initially said and it's really more fans of the show that are still watching now. But when it comes to Megan, same thing happened is that maybe she got a big bump in the beginning and maybe she got one to two million, but then it started getting into the 100 to $200,000, 2000 person range. And she's only on Spotify and she's got competitors from everywhere. She's being beaten by other podcasts that are on every single channel. So how can she say she had the number one podcast in the world? Or how can her fans say that if it's fundamentally not true, impossible for her to have the world's number one podcast because there was no way she beat Joe Rogan because he always had the top three podcasts in episodes. And so if Megan's episode, her top ranking one, I think was six and she can't even break into the top five. How in the world was she number one? It wasn't, it's a facade. It was a fabrication to artificially prop up Megan. And we see this as well with the variety in the cut interview. They tried to portray Megan, you know, they did the close up on her face of both of them. And particularly for variety, they did this like majestic, oh, Megan, she's looking at the stars because she's going to become one. And she's talking about what they're going to do, but there's nothing really there. And she even makes a critical mistake of talking about how, well, they're like, well, what do you watch? She's like, well, we search, we look through Netflix and we scroll and scroll and scroll. I'm like, honey, you're being paid for by Netflix. You need to have a Netflix show to say, because guess what they're paying you. They're probably paying for this interview, paying for this puff piece for you to slowly build up to what they know is going to be a reality TV show in December. And she basically shot herself and them in the foot by going that she doesn't even really watch Netflix series. <laughs> Oh, so bad. And again, it showed that some of what was going on was completely artificial because she really had nothing to say. Then she's won all these awards and you're like, why they've won the NAACP award. Why they had, they didn't do anything. Then you have, she won a Gracie award for her podcast and you're like, well, sure it was number one, but does anybody really care? And then you have obviously the Ms. Award and she was given that because she's friends with Gloria Steinman and that ended disastrously as well. And Megan, when she was initially came on the scene, they talked about, oh, how much of a successful actress she was. And I'm like, and they mentioned horrible bosses and it's like, I've seen that movie. I don't remember her in there at all. And I was like racking my brain, trying to think of where she was in it. And then when I looked through it and I was like, Oh, she, she's in there for 20 seconds. That's nothing. And even when it came to suits, I watched psych, I had the DVDs and they show a preview of suits on there and they only mentioned the, the, the initial two guys. And so it's like, I had no clue she was even on that show. I had no clue who she was. And so when they're telling me initially, Hey, she's this hugely successful actress. And I'm like, what metric are you using? Hugely successful means I've heard of her. Cause I watch Hollywood pretty closely and I'm somebody who's great at retaining information. If I had seen her, if I was familiar with her, I would have remembered her. She was not even a blip on the radar. So when her PR machine goes into overdrive at it, it is right now trying to prop her up. We've gotten also the story recently from Newsweek talking about how she's this fashion icon. And I'm like, how is she a fashion icon? How is everybody clamoring to dress her? A, we hardly see her. And when it came to the Dior deal, she looks horrible in Dior. She really does. Everything from Dior and Givenchy, I think were not great for her. And I think it's because her style doesn't fit the classic feminine silhouette of Dior because she just naturally doesn't have that. She has a very boxy shape. So she needs a different designer that focuses more on perhaps highlighting boxy shapes or creating curves rather than a company that's there to enhance your curves. Cause she doesn't really have any, so you can't really enhance what you don't have. I think this artificialness of Megan is hitting reality at this point. 
And because of that, her brand is starting to collapse around her because it was built on a house of sand, not on stone. When you are building a brand, you need it to be built around authenticity. I do this, I say this, I'm consistent in my wording, I'm consistent in what I'm saying. I'm always consistent on this channel, you'll notice. Even though I say some things that perhaps people disagree with, I really am consistent in my own understanding of how things work. And I'm pretty consistent in what I say and my opinions. Yes, sometimes my opinions change, but I do try to be genuine in what I'm saying, genuine in what I believe and what I'm telling you. And you can always double check the research, make your own opinions. That's totally fine. But I don't feel like I come across as artificial and I feel like people who met me on the tour. So again, if you're interested in meeting me in person in Germany and Austria, I'd love to have you. And it's like, they're like, yeah, you were exactly who I thought you were. And I was like, great. That's exactly what I wanted. That's exactly what I wanted because I want to be real with people. And Megan's not because we get these two differing sides to the, her story all the time. One where she's great and one where she can be rather nasty. And because of that brand, Megan is not working. And even though WME, William Morrison Endeavor is trying to rehabilitate her brand, they will fail because there's nothing there to rehabilitate if Megan's not real. Megan is creating this Instagram fabrication of her life, herself, her personality, everything. And none of that is going well. None of it will go over well long term. What Megan needs to do is take a step back and be herself. Yes, maybe she's greedy. Maybe she's narcissistic. Maybe she's kind of a nasty person. But at least if she owns that, rather than crafting this whole facade of this very perfection, because I know perfection doesn't exist, so her trying to be perfect or seem perfect is just always gonna skew to me as wrong then there's just no brand that she can build because I think the people who buy into her, and this is why I think the Sussex stands are freaking out is because they are people who believe the facade. They're people who believe that what she was spinning was actually the truth. And then when the truth comes out, they can't handle it because they don't know how to differentiate between fact and fiction. And Megan has spun us a whole bunch of fiction and not a lot of fact. And that's what I try to give you guys is facts about reals, realty, how it works, because Megan has thrived off very much about people not understanding royalty. And because of that, she's been able to get away from so much. But again, all that is starting to crumble and crater around her. And she doesn't know what to do, I think. But brand Megan will fail. And it will fail wholly because of Megan Markle. And I think Prince Harry may come out of this somewhat okay, but Meghan definitely won't. And looking at all this cratering, collapsing a brand, Meghan, her go-to never fails to once again become an influencer. So guys, I believe that the TIG will be resurrected at some point and she'll try that and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But I think at the same time, people are just abandoning the brand of Megan. And I don't think she can entice them back with empty platitudes. So I think she'll have to embrace her inner narcissist, her inner influencer, and her inner self-obsessed nature to really perhaps sell her brand. But she actually needs to sell it not as her being this great philanthropist, humanitarian, actor, producer, whatever. She just needs to sell herself as an influencer. Be done with it. Be shallow, Megan. Embrace your inner shallowness because that is who you are. That's how you can build brand Megan rather than trying to do all these other things that just aren't working. So guys, let me know what you think of the collapsing brand Megan. I'd love to know. I appreciate you watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.